there! I'm Sarah A. Christman, the author of The Tales of Chetsumoka, and this is my husband Gabriel. Hello everyone. And today we're going to tell you a bit about soda culture and history that comes up at the end of my book, A Trip in a Tumble. At the end of book five in my Tales of Chetsumoka series, A Trip and a Tumble, there's a scene involving a pretty nifty piece of Victorian technology that was reasonably common at the end of the 19th century, but has largely been forgotten and isn't very well known anymore. It's called a gasogene, and it's a device for making carbonated water at home to use in sodas. A lot of people might not necessarily realize that humans have been drinking carbonated beverages for pretty much as long as we've been around on this planet. The first soda waters were naturally occurring mineral waters, which were carbonated by the Earth's chemical and geological activities. Since ancient times and throughout human history, natural springs have often been considered sacred spaces. The waters of these springs were thought to have special healing properties, and the seemingly magical waters which emerged at certain places and contained sparkling bubbles were considered especially helpful for improving or maintaining health. Besides their religious and medical importance, mineral springs also served important social functions as well. The ancient Romans built elaborate infrastructures around their baths, some of which still exist today. Throughout the centuries, people have made pilgrimages to mineral springs for a variety of reasons, some religious, some health-related, some social. For many people, it's often been a combination of all of these. Spa culture has been important for a long time, and is big business for the locations blessed enough to have a natural source of pure, sparkling water. Not every town is lucky enough to have such a spring, though, and not every individual can make a pilgrimage to places that do. Many famous spas worked out that they could help far-flung humanity, and coincidentally increase their profits, by bottling their special waters and selling them abroad. It was only a matter of time before human ingenuity worked out ways to create sparkling water from waters which were naturally still. The earliest machines for carbonating water and making seltzer were large and elaborate, but smaller versions were eventually produced, and by the end of the 19th century equipment was available for families to make their own seltzer water at home. And this brings us back to the gasogene. Okay, so I'm going to use one tablespoon of acid, and the most common type was tartaric acid here, because it doesn't add much flavor. Tartaric acid is made from grapes and is a non-alcoholic byproduct of the wine industry. After grapes are mashed up and the grape juice poured off, a Thin white crystal accumulates around the edge of the vats from the acidity of the grapes, and this white crystalline substance is tartaric acid. And then baking soda. Go. And as anyone who's ever combined baking soda and vinegar can tell you, they produce when you combine an acid and a base, they produce. Yes. Since the tartaric acid and the baking soda were both dry powders when we put them together, they won't start reacting until we get them wet. And that'll happen when we turn over the gas agent. So this is what we're using as a seal right on here. The connector goes right through here. So this is the coupler that links the top and the bottom of the gasogene, and it's got string with beeswax as the seal, and then here are the holes for the gas to come in, and here are the holes for the gas to go out. Stays put, and then this, threads down over the top. Now the reason we have this adapter piece is because these threads on the original gasogene are very worn out and this 
adapter piece is matched to the worn threads on both sides and allows us to get a better seal. The top of the apparatus at this point gets filled up with ordinary non-sparkling still water, which very soon, through the magic of the gasogene, will become seltzer. The next step is to thread these together upside down. So, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. When he turns the gasogene right side up again, the water will dribble down through the lower holes in the coupler. As soon as the dry tartaric acid and baking soda get wet, a chemical reaction will start that will force gas into the water in the top chamber under pressure. Okay, now we have everything together upside down. The nice step here is to get to flip it over, which causes water to go in. Oops, let's shut that all the way off first. Yep, getting our first few bubbles here. This antique gasogene is, was made in the 1880s. It leaks a little by now, but it's only fair to point out that by the time I'm over 130 years old, I'll probably leak too. Back to a bit of history. The earliest artificial seltzers tried to recreate the chemical composition of soda waters from famous spas. Recipe books written for apothecaries and druggists who'd gotten into the soda water trade gave instructions for imitating Vichy water or Saratoga water by adding very exact proportions of minerals like magnesium sulfate or sodium bicarbonate. From here, it was a small step to adding other medicines to seltzer, and druggists starting, started adding tincture of valerian or potassium phosphate, which was recommended to settle an upset stomach. Sweeteners were added to make bitter medicines more palatable, and druggists played around with different formulas to optimize the attractiveness of these drinks to the public. They were so effective that people started considering soda as a fun treat and not just a medicine. This wasn't as re revolutionary of a concept as one might think, since after all it ties back into the ages-old connection between sparkling beverages and social activities. In the late 19th century, temperance advocates were especially strong proponents of soda culture because they wanted to steer people away from saloons and encourage them to do their socializing in healthier, more innocent environments. Cyclists tended to be big fans of soda as well, for the obvious reason that alcohol and cycling don't mix very well, but also because many of the, the sodas involving high-energy sugar and nutrient-rich milk or cream were the perfect energy drinks for active cyclists. There have been various ways of producing homemade carbonated beverages over the centuries. Bottled water and gasogene soda water were considered especially healthy because there was no fermentation involved with them. Specially formulated soda flavorings like those available at soda counters, though, could be very complicated and tricky to produce at home. So companies and druggists offered concentrated syrups for popular beverages. People then added these to bottled seltzer or to their own homemade gasogene seltzer. And then, of course, one could also add other tasty ingredients as well. The first cream sodas really were just that, cream sodas. And milk and soda was consider considered a particularly good drink for cyclists. And then there are all the little accoutrements that go with sodas and make them extra fun. When sodas became really popular in the 1890s, soda, special soda straws were definitely a thing. Uh, this one's silver-plated. It's got some nice filigree on it. I'll show you a close-up soon. And very, very recently, these have made a comeback as fancy mate straws or tea straws, but 
People were using these in sodas in the 19th century in a lot of different places. Also in the late 19th century was the invention of the paper drinking straw, which is kind of cheaper than these, to say the least, and more disposable. These are also making a comeback in certain cities. Traditions of sodas being little luxuries and an innocent way to socialize persisted into the 20th century and of course are still with us in the 21st. The next time you indulge in a bubbly beverage, remember, you're tasting history. I'm